All right. Uh, Revelation chapter 7. Uh, we were studying the number that is significant in this part. Uh, if we pick it up in verse 2 of Revelation 7, I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God, and he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed an hundred and forty and four thousand of the tribes of the children of Israel. And then it goes to list each tribe of the tribe of Judah, were sealed twelve thousand of the tribe of Reuben, sealed twelve thousand of the tribe of Gad, were sealed twelve thousand of the tribe of Asher, were sealed twelve thousand the tribe of Naphtali were sealed 12,000 of the tribe of Manasseh were sealed 12,000 now here's here's where it gets a little to some it might be a little confusing Joseph if you remember in toward the end of Genesis Joseph um, was the 11th son of Jacob and when um, he brought his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. Manasseh was the firstborn. Ephraim was the secondborn. When he brought them to, to um, their father, their grandfather, to be blessed, Joseph did this on purpose. He brought Manasseh because... Jacob couldn't see very well at the time, so he brought Manasseh to uh, Jacob's right hand, brought Ephraim to Manasseh's left hand, and expected uh, his father to just stretch forth his hand and give them each uh, the firstborn, the right hand blessing, the secondborn, the left hand blessing. And it had to do with um, how much of the um, of the inheritance that each one would receive so as he does that uh, Jacob wittingly in other words he knew what he was doing he took his hands and he crossed them and he gave Ephraim the right hand blessing and Manasseh the left hand blessing and Joseph inquired of that. No, no, dad, no, dad, you've got it all. You know, he's probably thinking dad's losing it a little bit. He can't see. Um, but Jacob knew exactly what he was doing. And it's an overall picture of, and, and we see this all through the book of Genesis. Uh, Ishmael is born first and then Isaac but Ishmael is the child of bondage. Isaac is the child of promise. So you have that flipped around. And then um, um, uh, Isaac and Rebekah get married. And they have Jacob and Esau. Esau is born first. Jacob is born second. But then uh, Esau sells his birthright to Jacob for uh, basically a, a pot of stew lentils and um, then Jacob goes in when it's time to receive the, the blessing he goes in covered in goat fur and smelling like an animal and um, goes in his father says well it's Jacob's voice but it's Esau's fur so he goes ahead and blesses Jacob with that firstborn son blessing. So there you have another switch. Then Jacob goes out and he's going to marry uh, Rachel because she's the one he's in love with. She was the second born, but he was, she was the first love of, of Jacob. So when he wants to marry uh, Rachel, they have a big party, have a big wedding celebration. They probably got a little drunk 
And he wakes up the next morning and finds out it's Leah that he had married. Uh-oh, now he's angry. And he says, look, I worked seven years for uh, Rachel. How come I got Leah? And their father said, well, it's because you can't, you know, it's not our way. The, the firstborn has to get married first. Fulfill her week. And then you can have Rachel, but you, you owe me another seven years. So he fulfilled the week, married Rachel, and then he did the other seven years uh, of labor uh, in order to, to pay for that. And so you have this going back and forth all the time. The second, this, the one who comes last is first. And the one who comes first is last. And that's what Jesus told in the gospels. He who is first shall be last. He who is last shall be first in the kingdom of God. And so you have the nation of Israel. God came to them first, gave them the oracles of God, gave them the commandments, gave them the, the written law of God, uh, gave them the Ark of the Covenant, the tabernacle, the showbread, the candlestick, gave them all of those things. And yet they constantly rejected him. So when Christ came, he came first to his own brethren came as a Jew to his Jewish people, but eventually they rejected him. So just like in one of his parables, he says, go, go out to the highways and byways and call them in who would come into this wedding feast. I don't care how they're dressed, don't, don't care what they look like, don't care who they are. If my own people won't come, then I'll bring in people that will come. And that's how us Gentiles get to be saved. We are dead last as far as God is concerned, but we have been saved first. And so when he mentions here the tribe of Manasseh, uh, yeah, verse 6, that's what that's part of. And Manasseh is going to take the place of somebody else. In verse 7, we have of the tribe of Simeon were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Levi were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Issachar were sealed 12,000. And then of the tribe of Zabulon were sealed 12,000. Then the tribe of Joseph. That's basically where Ephraim would have been mentioned. So the tribe of Joseph here, I believe, refers to uh, the tribe of Ephraim, um, where Manasseh and Ephraim were split into two separate tribes. Here we have the tribe of Joseph, which I believe is Ephraim, were sealed 12,000. And then of the tribe of Benjamin, were sealed 12,000. And what you have missing here is the tribe of Dan. Dan is missing. Dan is one of the 12. Um, but for various reasons, there's a lot of idolatry in Dan. If you'll, if you'll remember, um, when, in fact, I have a picture of this. I'll put it up on the screen here in a minute. Yeah. Um, if you look up on the screen, uh, Dan oh, is to your, it's to your right. And, uh. That would be to the north. Judah down here on the bottom is facing east. And when the Israelites picked up their camp and left, it was always Judah that was first. And you had the various tribes of the Levites around different places uh, wherever they could go in and amongst the 12 tribes. But Judah was always the first in line. Dan was always the tail. He always was. He was always last. And um, there's just, there's a lot of speculation, a lot of uh, different people saying different things about Dan, why he's not 
uh, in the list of the tribes of Israel anymore. Uh, but what it does to me, it matches, you have 12 apostles. Which of those 12 apostles gets taken out and replaced by somebody else? Judas Iscariot. Judas Iscariot lost his office of apostleship because of his betrayal of Christ. And then it was, um, oh, who was it that took his place? Huh? Matthias. Matthias, thank you. The Matthias that took his place. And so that's the, you have the same model in the Old Testament as you do with the New Testament. Somebody losing their spot, probably of rejection of God somehow, some way, and then someone else being a replacement uh, for them in their spot. We were uh, talking about the number 12 um, and, and why there are 12 tribes, why 12,000 was picked out of all 12 tribes, the number, number 144,000 and so on. If you look in um, Revelation 14, Turn to Revelation 14. And, I, and I'm dead, dead, dead serious. We're going to have a very short service if some of our men don't stand up and help their pastor out this morning. Okay? And I would hate to have a short service. I would just hate that, okay? So uh, I do want you men to be uh, thinking of something that God has blessed you with, a, a verse that you have seen over and over in your life that has worked. Uh, maybe that's something that's part of your testimony. Let's hear from God's men this morning, all right? Maybe that'll be a blessing to somebody that's watching online. Uh, we have several people over the years that have asked me about uh, being in the ministry. And um, I always tell them, I always give them an easy answer. If God wants you in the ministry, you'll wake up one day and you'll be in the ministry. Okay, now there might be some things that lead up to that that God brings along in your life but it, I believe that finding the will of God is a whole lot simpler than sometimes what we make out of it. Um, in Revelation chapter 14, I looked and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Sion and with him in hundred and forty and four thousand having his father's name written in their foreheads. If you go back to Revelation 7, that is exactly what, what they have, they have, in verse 2, they have the seal of the living God um, in their foreheads. In verse 3, until we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. So in Revelation 14, I believe this is the exact same group. And I heard a voice from heaven uh, as the voice of many waters and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. Of course you do. If they're harpers and they're harping, obviously they're harpers harping with their harps. And they sung as it were a new song before the throne and before the beast. And the elders and no man can learn that song but the 144,000 which were redeemed from the earth. Now, let me just kind of uh, wind this part of it down real quick about the number 12 and what I believe it means. If you look at the picture up on the screen uh, and turn to, turn to Psalm 19. Psalm 19. And fooey on anybody who says that the universe just exploded into existence. 
and it has no order to it. It's the dumbest thing. I, it actually takes more faith in unproven theories than it does to just believe the Bible. It does. Because you have so many, you have so many unproven, untested theories when it comes to evolution, the beginning of the universe, how the stars formed, how the, how the earth formed, how life formed on this planet, the very first living organism, a one-celled organism that just formed all at once and was then able to reproduce itself? Come on, are you kidding me? That's like asking, um, it's like asking me to build a Ford truck out of nothing. Okay? Anybody that knows me and my mechanic skills know that it's impossible. Uh, Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God, the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day utter his speech, night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. He go, his going forth is from the end of heaven and his circuit unto the ends of it. And there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. So if we have, uh, uh, let's see if I can draw this on here. See if I can get a, can't get, I can't get a little, uh, there it is. I need a felt tip pen, there we go. So, well now I can't find it, there it is. So, let's say that this is, this is Judah, so this would be east, okay, where I'm drawing this red line, that's east. Imagine the sun, in fact, Psalm 19 just told you that the heavens above us are a tabernacle, which means that they're built exactly like the tabernacle. So when we look up in the heavens, first thing in the morning, we have, where is it? We have the sun rising up in the east, and in the east here, the only doorway into the tabernacle is on the east side. That's the only way to get in there. Then as the high priest enters into the tabernacle, here is the altar. It's where the sacrifices are burnt. The blood is let out. Here is the brass uh, laver, it's called, it's where we get the word lavatory. And here is where the priest would wash himself before he could enter into the sanctuary. Here's the sanctuary. He enters into the sanctuary and he's going west. And here's west here. Okay? Just like the sun. So the sun goes in from the east travels east to west, and that is exactly how the high priest uh, moves when he enters into the tabernacle. He goes from east to the west, and in the west then is the most holy place uh, where the, the blood of sprinkling takes place. Now I want you to notice that in each one of these, let's see, each one of these spots here, there's one, Two, right here, three, four, five, six, seven, come on, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 
So we have 12 tribes and we have 12 months. And every month, if we were to go out at night, and I've said this before, we would see a different set of stars in the sky. So imagine each one of these camps, campsites where each tribe is as being a month and the stars up in the sky because God said that the tribes of Israel would be as the stars of heaven for multitude, which is why the camp of the tabernacle matches exactly what happens every year. Every year and of all 12 months, there is a different tribe and a different set of stars in the night sky at a certain certain time. You go out a certain time every night, uh, let's say on the 15th of every month, there's a new set of stars there that wasn't there last month in that position. Okay? So when God said to Israel that I will make you as the stars of heaven, he meant it. Now the ultimate of all of this is the fact that, uh, let's see here. Uh, yeah, in Revelation 21, this is the new Jerusalem. He carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God and her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. And had a wall great and high and had 12 gates and at the gates 12 angels and the names written thereon which are the names here it is the names of the 12 tribes of the children of israel now this city is the heavenly jerusalem so just like 12 different sets of stars in the night sky you have the city of god heavenly jerusalem that has 12 different entrance gates that goes into it. And for each gate is the name of one of the tribes of Israel. On the east three gates, on the north three gates, on the south three gates, and on the west three gates. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations. And in them the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. So we get our place in it too. The 12 tribes get the 12 gates of the city. The 12 apostles that we follow get their places in the heavenly city as well by there being 12 foundation stones plus one more. And who would that one more be? It would be Jesus Christ the chief what? Corner stone. He's going to be in here too. Or there can be no continuing city. Let me say this to you. Doesn't it sound like. That barring a miracle from God. We're going to lose everything in this country that we believe is precious to us. Amen? Don't fret. We have a better nation, a better country, and a better city that we're all citizens of. Where there will be no more Joe Bidens. Amen. 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 <laughs> We were, we uh, stopped Friday in Indiana. They have all these um, covered bridge festivals. They're all over the state. And so we stopped at one on the way home yesterday. We walked, they've got all these shops and everything like that and carnival stuff. And so before we leave, we got to get us a, uh, a funnel cake. So we sit down with our funnel cake and there's some older couples sitting there and one guy's got a military cap on, another guy's got a Trump cap on. And I'm, we're sitting there and I said, can we sit here with y'all? And they said, 
yeah, as long as you're going to share that funnel cake with us. I said, well, that depends on one thing. He said, what's that? I said, did you vote for Joe Biden? He said, I ain't even going to answer that. <laughs> Let's bow for prayer. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you, God, for the new Jerusalem that awaits us. We thank you for the promises, those great and precious promises that you've made in your word. You made them to Israel. You're not going to break them. You've made them to us through the 12 apostles. You're not going to break those promises either. God, you're a God that just, you cannot lie. You cannot lie. So, Father, we thank you, God, for being merciful to us, for making great and precious promises to us. And, Father, through your mercy, your forgiveness, our godly sorrow that brings repentance, Father, through all of these things, you have both kept your promises, Father, the people that have left us and have gone on before us. Father, we believe with all our heart that you have kept your promise to them and to us through them. And so, Father, we believe with all of our heart that when it's our time to go and stand before you, you will be faithful and you will be just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Thank you, God, for being a God who keeps his promises. We thank you for this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen.